morning. Hello and welcome to Dialogue and Debate with Cumberland Lodge. My name is J.P. Rangaswamy and I'm one of the trustees at Cumberland Lodge. I'm delighted to be chairing this final webinar of the four-part mini-series we've been having on issues of race and justice in policing, education, the culture sector, and the wider society at large with Cumberland Lodge. The first three webinars of this mini-series have already taken place over the past fortnight. In case you've missed them, the recordings are available on the read, watch, and listen page of the Cumberland Lodge website. These previous webinars have been focused on Cumberland Lodge reports entitled Race in Britain, Inequality, Identity and Belonging, Difficult Histories and Positive Identities, and our work on resilient communities. Today, we're pleased to welcome three new guests to reflect on the conversations throughout the series and to identify the key areas where action needs to be taken what that action should be to address the persistence of racism, structural inequality, and racial discrimination in the UK. I'd like to welcome Heather Hatton, who's a PhD student at the History Department of the University of Hull and Cumberland Lodge Scholar. Welcome, Heather. Sundar Katwala, the Director of British Future, and Wilf Sullivan, the Race Equality Officer of the Trades Union Congress. Welcome to all of you. To those watching this morning, do please get involved, submit any questions you'd like to put to our guests as we go on. You can submit questions via the Q&A function if you watch live on Zoom or by tweeting at Cumberland Lodge or commenting on our Facebook live stream. But let's get on with the debate. Well, the series so far has shed light on the importance of acknowledging that a problem exists in order to stop adverse outcomes from replicating. Has the momentum around Black Lives Matter helped society to identify where these problems lie? I don't think it's done that, but what I do think is that um it's put the issue of race back onto the agenda um, to be debated. I think um, that often uh, big events um, change the way that people talk about things and the narrative around things, and especially in terms of race. And over time, that changes. So, you know, uh, sort of in Britain, Stephen Lawrence and that that report was quite a seminal moment, which got everybody talking about institutional racism and what we needed to do about it. But in some ways that got su su uh, superseded after September the 11th, which uh, completely changed the discourse uh, to one about, uh, uh, about security and about communities and about radicalization and actually squeezed the space for talking about race discrimination. I think what the Black Lives Matter movement moment has done is open that space up again. Heather, what's your perception on that? Um, yeah, I really agree um, with what Wilf um, was just saying in that it's kind of put um, racism back on the agenda. And I really feel that it's raised awareness within kind of the UK of the need for everyone to educate themselves on kind of racial inequalities and injustices within our society and how um, in inequalities are created by particular historical contexts and decisions that were made and ongoing legacies of like colonialism and empire. Um, and I think that it's also kind of raised awareness of how injustices continue to be perpetuated by the selection of particular historical narratives um, at the expense of other narratives, the privileging of certain stories and voices over others. Um, and I think that um, in terms of um, from an educational perspective, it's kind of uh, created the awareness that we all need to kind of come need to come together to create more representative um, historical discourses that are more nuanced through the inclusion of um, a multiplicity of voices and perspectives. And it's kind of helped educators really think that um, what is the purpose of a history education? 
Um, is it perpetuating these power structures that we have in society? Or would it be better that history education was about equipping students with the critical thinking skills that they needed to challenge these um, power structures? Sundar, do you have any views on what Wolf has already said on this? Yes, certainly there's increased salience, increased awareness, increased commitments to now do something. And so the question is, what, what is that something going to be? And are we going to see a sustained change out of, out of this moment of, of growing awareness? And I think that's going to be quite difficult. Um, and I think this seminar series has captured some of the ways in which that is challenging. There are so many things to talk about, about race in our society, police and crime and justice, history and identity, opportunity and education, um, which statues we want and don't want. And the debate moves around in these different ways and it, you don't know where it's going to end up. And it's ended up in quite a lot of, I think, cultural debate about symbols which is important because history and identity matter. But again, that might squeeze out other debates. Also, this has come out of um, a killing in America that shocked America, shocked the world, and was used in the UK and in other countries to raise issues about what's happening here. COVID inequalities were happening here. Race inequality is a matter of life and death. There are other issues. But the British debate we need is going to be different from the debate they have in America. And so what Black Lives Matter is saying is that the black experience is specific. One in six people in Britain are from an ethnic minority background, but the 3% of people who are black might experience that differently from people who are Indian, people who are from South Asian Muslim backgrounds and other uh, backgrounds. Um, the specific experience of being black in America and the specific experience of being black in Britain are different. And so working out what the debate is we want to have here about our institutions, about our companies, about our political system, about our crime and justice system, it might be difficult if the debate is sort of in a way set on American terms and then comes across the internet, um, across the Atlantic on the internet to us. So I think we've got to work out what are our priorities for change now? And what's being squeezed out a bit, I think, is the sense of where have we come what progress have we made to build on? Where are the big gaps and where should we focus our attention in this very, very wide ranging, complicated agenda about race and opportunity in Britain? Okay, well, if I, if I can probe that a little further, Sundar, I mean, throughout the series, we've been speaking about how there are many conversations being held society-wide about structural and institutional racism. And obviously there are nuances of difference depending on the particular geography or the sector it comes from. But uh, rather than conversations, there is also a sense that we need to ensure that action is taken. Right? How do we take this opportunity now to, to be able to create sustained change? Uh, you know, are, we, are we chatting too much and acting too little? <laughs> Yes, I think to some extent. Obviously, conversation is good. Dialogue, hearing voices that haven't been heard is important. But I think a very broad debate about the structures of racism across centuries, across the world, um, and how that still influences us today, that's an important foundation. But what I want people who are showing solidarity or saying we must act to do is now to focus on the change that they can make closer to home that is within their system that if you're a school or a university or a company or a trade union not what should we all talk about fixing in the world but actually what is your piece on your patch of what you will have done this year and what will that look like in two years or three years time because I think there's a frustration with the debate that gets stuck between you know these general points that you know there's an impatience I think about how much needs to change and other people saying but there has been some progress I think we need to be very specific An example I would give you is that we've made a lot of progress in our school results especially for ethnic minority uh, school children, especially in London over the last decade, and all groups have risen perhaps at different rates. So we see um, ethnic minorities more likely to be undergraduates, more likely to be graduates than the white British. That for me is progress we can build on, but it makes it more urgent that the fact that if you send in a CV and you change the name to an ethnic name, you will get less job interviews. It's incredibly important to fix that now. Otherwise, people who believe in the story of equal opportunity get a good education, find out that that story just isn't true enough 
for them to feel they get fair chances for their peers. But that's a that's a different kind of problem to say um, exclusion in the school system or um, the criminal justice system. So there's a race equality agenda you know, at the, for the marginalised and for the most disadvantaged. There's a race equality agenda for, you know, the average young graduate. What will their experience of life be like? And there's a race equality agenda right at the top. When will this hit the boardroom? And I think instead of saying which ones of those matter, we need a focused agenda that actually makes progress on all of these fronts. Okay. And there's a theme that keeps, keeps coming through on the, the education aspect of this. And Heather, in our, in our webinar on difficult histories, we debated the effectiveness of decolonizing the, colonializing the curriculum. And Dr. Tristan Hunt had said that this wouldn't have as much of an impact as we would hope, or that more time needs to be allocated to history across the curriculum and <coughs> catching, picking up on some of the sort of structural changes element. And you also introduced the aspect that it's not just the curriculum, but also the attendees, as it were, the students. So what are your views on this topic? Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree with um, what Tristan um, Hunt said the other day in that schools do not have the time at Key Stage 3 to teach these difficult, complex um, history topics. And um, that often because of the high demands and the contextually heavy GCSE subjects that we now have uh, um, in history, that, you know, um, Key Stage 3 has been squeezed into two years and we just don't have time to do justice to these um, really hard, difficult topics topics and um, so I think um, in terms of changes that do need to be made though to the um, historical kind of cu curriculum in the UK I do believe that the government needs to take a kind of more um, active role because I know there are good things and good resources um, being made by teachers um, about how to make the cur curriculum more inclusive and how to create more inclusive schemes of work and um, but there's just not the kind of funding or the time for resource creation there also isn't teachers don't know what resources are out there and this kind of leads to this vicious cycle of only teaching to what you know and exam boards not creating textbooks for um, topics such as the African Kingdom which have no um, uptake so um, I really feel that the kind of the government could um, and should step in and you know rather than just saying we should have culturally and geographically diverse history curriculums and leaving that up to history teachers, I agree with what was kind of said um, by the Runnymede Trust in that we need to make topics like migration compulsory um, and we must be made to grapple with these um, uh, difficult histories in the classroom um, with government legislation, because I think there are, you know, 27 percent of the kind of state funded school um, population are um, pupils from BAME backgrounds. And if we don't allow or create histories which uh, allow these students to see themselves within those particular histories, I think it's very damaging. And I also think we need to really address the absence um, of black British experiences within the curriculum um, another way which I think the government might be able to help is if they created better funding and um, for teacher training and CPD programs um, as noted in the last seminar as uh, um, sorry the last webinar as well and um, we've got excellent provision in the UK um, from the Institute of Education and UCL for Holocaust teaching and how to do uh, justice to such a complex topic However, I feel like we need more standardization and more training for teachers on topics such as empire and such as colonialism and such as um, migration to the British Isles. Um, and then the kind of final thing that I realize I think is a kind of um, where the government could intervene and should intervene more is that there needs to be kind of more incentivization for there to be a dialogue between higher education and secondary um, school teaching and that um, kind of current scholarly thinking isn't kind of trickling down and permeating into the into school textbooks and into school classrooms and I think this is kind of very um, very detrimental in the fact 
um, that it creates very binary thinking and, um, uh, you know, very one-sided histories. And um, my particular research um, area, I, um, I, I'm involved with a research cluster called Treated Spaces, who look at um, treaties as instruments of diplomacy and conquest, but also present them as kind of dynamic and contested documents central to the ongoing debates within the US and Canada about, uh, Canada about native sovereignty and rights. And my research looks at kind of Native American people as agents of um, change and as really kind of um, powerful forces within these this diplomatic process with the crown. And these kind of ideas don't filter into the classroom. So I really feel like the government needs to step in and kind of um, create a structure which will facilitate this knowledge exchange between higher education and also secondary education so we can create more inclusive, diverse histories was being with a uh, question to you just following on what from what Heather was saying uh, when it comes to being able to exemplify black British history within the curriculum make sure that the kind of skills are invested in to be able to teach it right deal with the challenge of that the training aspects of it what is what has your experience been how do you relate to what Heather's been saying <laughs> Well, I mean, I think, I mean, what Heather said is really important, but it comes down to, I think, is what do we think we're trying to do when we educate young people in, in the first place? It seems to me that, you know, education has become about training people for jobs rather than equipping them to deal with the real world. And if you think it's about training people for jobs, then clearly, uh, you know, um, having a priority in making people understand uh, how we got here, how our society is structured and what the dynamics within that is, uh, are not a priority. And I think that's always uh, been uh, part of the struggle around racism, certainly in my lifetime, um, to get these things included on the agenda. And certainly sort of in the afro Korean community, what people ended up doing was teaching that history to their kids themselves through Saturday schools, uh, uh, because uh, uh, they recognized that trying to um, uh, get the state system to do that uh, uh, was not gonna be an easy task and was not gonna be something that was, would, be, would be won very easily. Um, but I think often we predicate these um, um, debates on the idea that everybody in society um, um, thinks that what we should be doing is getting rid of race, 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 racial discrimination and inequality and, and that we somehow or other live in a meritocracy. Um, and I think that's a, a really erroneous assumption to make if you, if you really want to uh, struggle to get rid of of discrimination. Um, you know, I only have to look at the front pages of some of our national newspapers every day to see how race is deployed, uh, not explicitly, but implicitly, uh, to maintain people's power and privilege. And I think, you know, that has an effect in terms of what we, what we try to achieve through public policy, and especially in terms of what, what our young people get taught, or what more, more explicitly, what they don't get taught. Sundar, what's your experience of this, you, in, in trying to deal with the, the future for the country as well? You must also have, uh, you know, relatively strong views on the need to have this experience of migrating to the British Isles that uh, was being referred to by uh, Heather, so what is your sense within that? What I think is really happening here in a very big way in our society is a shift in expectations across the generations. And that is why I think there's a lot of frustration from people who are told, well, you know, be patient because we're making some progress. You've got better opportunities than your grandparents had in the Windrush generation or than your parents. It's true that people have got better opportunities than their grandparents and parents have, but the expectation, if you were born in Britain, is that every prime minister told you there would be equal opportunities, equal identity, equal standing. And so you want that to be true. You don't want it to be true that you're a bit better off than in the 1990s. I mean, it, you know, 
I really do have a lived experience sense of progress because, you know, I had a football season ticket as an 11 year old at Everton. And so there's a style of overt racism that I heard in public that my children will never hear. Um, I cast a vote as an adult for a House of Commons in which there were six ethnic minority MPs. And so that there are 65 means that um, black, Asian, people have much more voice and presence in our public life before to put these issues on the agenda. There were no Asian women in our part, in our House of Commons until 2010. Um, so that, you know, there's been a rapid shift, but expectations have risen faster than that. And people want to see it speed up. And I think our companies are not equipped to deal with this. They're not expecting this to happen um, this year and next year. They've been thinking about Brexit and COVID and climate change. They haven't been thinking about this. And um, because of the progress in education, a quarter of your intake uh, of graduates um, might be ethnic minorities across the board, black and Asian. Um, and that's probably twice as high as your workforce. And you get to senior management and you get to the board and it will be one in 16. And so there's a real cultural distance between a board saying, but we're a very liberal company. You know, we're trying very hard and we're sure it will all come through and you'll have as good a chance as everyone else. And your graduate intake saying this doesn't feel like the kind of institution it says it is. When I look at who's around the board table, a third of our FTSE 100 companies, a third of our NHS trusts have all white boards in the Britain of 2020 in which one in six citizens is not white. So I think there's an expectation of a speeding up of change. And what companies have done is they've tweeted a hashtag and said, of course, it does not need to be said, but let it be said anyway. We recognise Black Lives Matter. We'd love to join this conversation. Um, we don't know enough black people. So we need to find some black people to have this conversation with. There's a real social distance, I think, in the way that some companies are endorsing the message and sort of saying, we don't really know what to do about this because we weren't ready for this challenge. Can I, can I just put an alternative point of view there? Because this thing about progress, you know, I think you have to main, measure progress in terms of the real life experience of people. I think young young people from BME communities today have less opportunities than my generation did. You know, what that, at least in my generation, there might have been a more, more overt racism out on the street, but actually you could probably get a full-time job. Um, you could earn, probably earn a, you know, a reasonable wage. What I see for a lot of young people now is precarious work, um, insecurity, you know, in terms of the overall economic situation, they've got a little chance of getting a place of their own. Um, and, and often we just describe progress in terms of position rather than actual um, um, and real life experience. I don't think expectations are higher today than they were for my generation. I'm still as angry about the inequality that faces my, myself and my children than I, were, than I am when I was 20. And I still have the accept, expectation that, that as a... As a, as a person that was born in this country, that I'm not going to be tolerated, that I should be treated as an equal. And I don't think that's any different for younger people out there today. I mean, I think what the frustration is, is about people ticking a box, saying the right thing, but never doing anything. And clearly, when people, especially young people, face a situation where I think their opportunities are going down, uh, then they feel much more pre that urgency in terms of a need for change. Um, and I think, you know, partly in terms of the reaction uh, that there has been to Black Lives Matter in terms of young people across this side of the Atlantic, it's just not just mirroring what's going on in America. It's about what's happening here. Those lack of opportunities, that, that um, abuse often by institutions and the state of them, um, in society, whether it's deaths in police custody, whether, it, whether it's, you know, the levels of stop and search on the street, uh, back to the levels of when I was a youth, um, and the ration, rationality of it. And I can, ex I can understand exactly, you know, if I put myself in that position of when I was in, that kind of anger that there is. Um, uh, because it's not just about... Um, um, about whether there's opportunities or whether they're going to, uh, 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 people are going to be able to climb the tree. It's about how you survive in the here and now. And for me, for young people, that's become a lot more difficult over the last 
10, 15 years? I think I think that's a powerful challenge. And, and I think, you know, I think there's a lot in that. What what I think it captures is that the pattern of opportunity and disadvantage is more complex than it's ever been. And so you've got the people who are saying, you know, if I do well in education, will will I be rewarded? And some people saying, I don't, you know, as you say, you know, things are going backwards for me. This country is very different depending on where you live, who your parents were whether you've got a degree or not. We've tended to think about that in terms of groups, you know, are Indians and Chinese people doing well, are black people being left behind? It's true within each of the groups, I think, by social class, that, you know, there's a black African middle class that might be doing very well and going to private schools and so on. And there are other people having exactly the experience that Wolf describes of, you know, work getting more precarious. So this is where I think we need to make sure you have a race agenda that's, you know, that goes right to the top, but that doesn't leave behind the people who, you know, need most support, most support to you know get 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 anywhere at all if i can move this to to get it uh, heather's view on it heather you know we're hearing about the fact that if we use some benchmarks there is progress uh, yet we're also hearing that the expectations of youth and the opportunities of youth in today's context are not necessarily the same and then we have the momentum of the black lives matter movement with all its nuances of difference between uh, the two sides of the Atlantic. For you personally, what have the past few weeks taught you? <laughs> have they sort of undermined or reinforced your beliefs in what you've been studying? Have you made to reflect on race issues differently? Could we get sort of your perspective on that thing? Yeah, I mean, I'm very conscious that on here I'm speaking as um, a, a privileged white PhD student and that I am very aware that I have never experienced um, racial discrimination. So um, in terms of what I have learned from the, the last couple of weeks is that I really feel that I need to acknowledge and check my privilege um, more, um, that I have a, a duty to educate kind of myself and reflect on my own personal kind of biases. And also to reflect on past mistakes um, and, and learn from them. So I know um, as a history teacher, when I was teaching five years ago, I did not do enough within my power to kind of um, create inclusive schemes of work um, or, you know, make sure that those um, multiple voices were were heard. Um, and I was, uh, you know, starting off as an NQT, I guess, perhaps I had kind of other priorities and other concerns that I was thinking about. But I think it's just the willingness to accept or to ad uh, don't be scared to admit that you have um, done something um, differently in the past, as long as you kind of can reflect critically on how you um, once acted and listen to the opinions of others and kind of move beyond um, this. Because I think it's really important to remember that, you know, anti-racism is a commitment to fighting racism, not just in society, but racism within inside yourself. So, you know, I think it's kind of this idea that everyone kind of needs to be able to admit to their own kind of um, biases and kind of work towards kind of um, changing them. And I really kind of think um, one of the kind of quotes that kind of sums it all up for me, um, I, uh, what I've learned really from the last kind of couple of weeks is a quote by Maya Angelou and she kind of um, really sums it up nicely and that she says, do the best you can do till you know better. And then when you know um, better, do better. So, you know, I think it's really kind of a continual reflection uh, on yourself. Um, and that's really what I've, I've learned over these last kind of, um, weeks. <laughs> Ashanda, uh, in, in, in recent months, do you feel that society has been reminded of the common values enough, reinforced that sense of shared belonging amongst communities? Have the narratives of division and conflict lessened as a result of Black Lives Matter? You know, one of the questions that's come up on uh, Zoom is that, you know, we use terms like uh, BAME and BME in this series, and also in mainstream media. What do the panelists feel about whether that itself is divisive? So I'm trying to get a sense of the, the community integration or division as a result of the momentum we see today. So if yeah, I could get Sundar's opinion first. This momentum, I don't think, is making people feel that society is less divided. It, it might be making people feel it's more divided. And there's a legitimacy to that. I think if you're 
going on one of these protests. You want to say we want to, you know, we want to urgently raise our voices, talk about how much is wrong, how much needs to change. There's anger here about injustice. We want to express it. Um, and so that's that can be, you know, people can join in. There are lots of white people on these protests. If you're, you know, young and you're a graduate, you're 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 likely to be with the protesters, not against them. But it's it's definitely a, an attempt to wake people up. And so and so that might be divisive. It's it's received then as divisive by other people, partly because of the lens it's put through on the media. If there are people with low contact um, with people who are black and Asian in this country, out where my in-laws live in Billericay, Essex, um, you know, reading the newspapers, and they think that the main aim of Black Lives Matter is to remove the statue of Winston Churchill, then they're going to think, why is race equality in our country about that? I'm happy to have history taught properly in schools. Let's hear all about Churchill. But is that like, do we need to remove things like that? For people to be a part of this country and that really worries me as well because it's a very bad reflection of i think asian and black opinion about this about this country you know the armies that fought those world wars look just as diverse as the britain of 2020 more than the britain of 1914 or britain of 1940 that's a story about colonialism it's probably a story about discrimination but it's also a story about service and sacrifice but people know that a bit more but don't know that so i think there's a polarization that is potentially constructive and catalyzing an urgent, but it's potentially dangerous if we don't then find the common ground for fair chances for everybody, break down the barriers. I think Heather just gave us a very good constructive account of how people can think about privilege. But I worry about a debate that says, let's have a debate about white privilege because we need, we need coalitions for change to tackle the barriers to opportunity for people who don't feel privileged, black and Asian working classes, the white working classes, different people of different kinds. And so I think a debate about white privilege deliberately provokes, starts an argument. It might be a necessary argument, but we've also then got to build the coalition for change and fairness. So there are different challenges there about how we go forward from this moment, I think. Will, so if I can sort of pick up on that, you know, you're seeing the momentum, you're, you're seeing we live in an unusual environment, especially with COVID-19 as well. Uh, you know, what inspires you the most about what's happening now that we can start channeling in order to see institutional and structural responses, action rather than words? What's the most inspirational thing you're seeing? Uh, for me, it's actually the energy of the young people are, that, that are, are um, that are involved and actually the fact that they're taking direct action. I mean, I think for too long we've, uh, you know, race has been, you know, talked about in public policy terms and in stuffy rooms about what processes uh, that we need to do to change our society. I mean, the reality is for me, race is about, is about uh, it, racism at fundamentally, at a fundamental level. It's not a national problem or American problem. It's, it's a, a problem, at, it, racism is a system. You know, it's not about just about individual relations or people's opportunities. Uh, and I think the young people see that. They want to change the world and, qu and they're quite right to want to change the world. I often think, uh, you know, the problem, you know, that, that's what inspires me because sometimes I think, you know, having been, been, been um, um, uh, around this and doing stuff around race equality uh, for so long, you get sucked into that debate about uh, only about looking at it in terms of incremental change. Um, but idealism is really important in terms of anything. And so for me, uh, that, um, that energy, uh, that demand, uh, that organising because people recognise uh, uh, that it's about about, about power and challenging power has been the thing that's most inspired me about about this particular moment and and, and long let it continue the, the one of the challenges obviously for for all of us is to to pick up on this theme on the the momentum that is not just there but converting that into action and each of you comes with considerable experience about how to get the institutional responses right, whether it's to consolidate what's happened so far, to raise awareness in the longer term, to make those sort of structural changes, whether it's in education, whether it's in the arts and culture, whether it's in government, whether it's in the third sector. 
So to make sure we don't sort of waste this opportunity and we convert this into not just a call for action, uh, what I'd like to do now is to, to get from each of you your, your advice on what the institutional responses uh, required today are so that we can learn from the conversations we've been having so far, but convert that into sort of kinetic energy. <laughs> Uh, Who would like to go first on that? I'll come in. Please. Um, yeah, just a, a symbolic commitment, because I think people could be specific about things they could do on a timescale. By the end of next year, no all-white boardrooms in large institutions of any kind in the United Kingdom. FTSE 100 companies are meant to get there. Um, NHS trusts haven't said they're going to do that. Arts and culture institutions haven't said they're going to do that. Major charities haven't said they're going to do that and they're not doing better. And then that's not just an exercise in finding, phoning you up JP and saying, you know, do you have someone who could, you know, turn up and not make too much trouble? It's about saying, and that will be a commitment to what is this institution going to have changed in the next three years or the next four years, that that's a change that everybody can make. And if you don't think you can make that, get the support to make it and then show us we've got there. It's not enough at all, but it basically says that, you know, every institution of power in this country will recognise it lives in a country where a sixth of people are, are non-white and that's got to be at the top table as well as among people coming in. And that is a foundation to take further action about what you're going to do over the next few years in your institution. Well, thank you for that. Will, uh, one of Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is a, a difficult one, JP, and it also relates to something that Heather said earlier about, uh, about people being prepared to, to look at themselves. Because I think for far too long, institutions have, uh, have externalised the problem of, of, of race. They haven't accepted, um, despite what the Lawrence Report said, that there's such a thing as institutional racism. Uh, and when they do accept it, it's about ticking a box. And all the solutions they come up with in relation to institutional racism are a deficit model, i.e. there's something wrong with, with black people and black communities, right? That they need to change, right? And actually, the, you know, all the solutions, but I ever hear people talking about whether it's about mentoring, talent pipelines, all this kind of stuff in my alone the work. Not once do I hear people say, what are they going to do to change their institutional culture? Um, you know, a lot of what I see in my line of work is actually workplaces uh, which are absolutely toxic, you know, in terms of people being able to exist in them uh, and survive in them. Uh, at, you know, if they're not part of, they're not perceived to be part of, of the dominant culture. So it's got to be more than about position. You know, people. Yes, it'd be great to see more, 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 more black people, and I use that term in the political sense on boards. But actually, if the culture of the of the, the of the institution remains the same, um, it won't make any difference. And believe you me, I've had to represent people. Uh, an industrial tribunal applications in the past for race discrimination in relation uh, to black managers. Because what the black managers do is actually end up replicating the culture of the organisation. So if that culture of that organisation isn't changed, if people don't recognise that actually they have to really fundamentally change the way that relations in that institution uh, um, um, work. It won't make a damn bit of difference if there's black people on the board, because that's not the issue, right? It's a, that's that is not the issue. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm in saying that I'm not arguing that there shouldn't be more black people on boards, but I'm saying that is not that is not the the the, the problem, right? The problem is is the institution. And that's why black people aren't on boards, because actually the institution is hostile um, uh, to, to being inclusive. Um, the, the ways that people operate, right, that are in privileged positions in those institutions is about maintaining their position and power. And if you don't challenge that, you're never going to get any change. Heather, the, you know, obviously any form of cultural transformation uh, obviously requires you know, governance model structures, looking at what the institutional values are, uh, 
you know, the themes that I'm hearing are all sort of uh, necessary, but not necessarily sufficient. And uh, so, you know, from an education perspective, and especially with what you're studying, I want to get your views again on tangible steps that we could take, because, uh, you know, uh, even though I care what you're saying, well, the, uh, you know, Sundar's point about the, it's, it is not, it may not be enough, but getting the governance improved would be a step towards getting some of the cultural transformation. But let's hear from Heather to see how she would respond to that. Yeah, I mean, definitely. And um, I think that even waiting for the kind of the government to act um, on the history curriculum within schools could take you, I mean, the history did curriculum is one of the most debated curriculums in the UK because of its politicized nature. And I think that, you know, we can, uh, we will be waiting probably years for the government to do anything decisive really about it. And so, you know, definitely I feel there are tangible actions that individuals and teachers um, and university kind of um, professionals can be taking um, themselves. So, um, what the kind of the pandemic has really highlighted to me um, is how many kind of good resources there are out there for teaching kind of inclusive curriculum, uh, sorry, have it making cr inclusive curriculums. Um, I, uh, you know, just be by being active on Twitter, I've kind of found many kind of um, good resources and um, to name one of them, there is a really kind of um, a, uh, a good kind of resource created by um, uh, Dr. Nick Dennis from the Schools History Project and two leading professionals, uh, uh, Trevor Gertz and Toby Green, um, who um, uh, have created this website about African kingdoms to enable um, schools to be able to teach kind of pre-colonial African history without having to rely on textbooks that just frankly aren't there. And um, that, you know, these kind of resources really will help kind of um, teachers um, take it upon them kind of, you know, themselves to kind of integrate these kind of lessons into the classroom and, you know, demonstrate um, that Africa has a vibrant, dynamic, really global history before um, colonization. And that, you know, I think one of the fundamental issues within the curriculum in the UK is that students often only come across kind of black history um, as like starting at the slave trade. And that's really fundamentally damaging to all kind of perceptions. So I think that, you know, there are really good resources out there. There's another good resource called Our Migration Story, which teachers can use to kind of, um, um, problematize and kind of include uh, get resources to include um, about a migration to the British Isles and to really kind of get students to think about how migration is not just a modern phenomena in British history it's you know it's there's been a long trajectory of migration from you know the medieval period and that it's really important I think that students understand this um, and yeah, just just really kind of making sure that you're aware of what's out there, just, you know, as, as a teacher or as an educator and trying to find these resources. Um, again, Schools History Project is really great. I attended a, another webinar the other day on how we might more effectively teach Native American history, um, to, particularly in terms of the American West kind of context um, and the kind of uh, legacies of settler colonialism. And so there's loads of resources out there. It's just, you know, we've kind of got to be um, maybe there's got to be a, a culture of sharing within the teaching community that will enable us to kind of really have uh, understand what resources are out there so we can better um, create these kind of inclusive curriculums and not wait for the government to act. Thank you Heather. Wilf if I could sort of also draw on something you'd been speaking out about earlier and uh, yesterday we had a, a, a really good seminar on uh, the role of policing within all this and some of the suggestions that came through was the greater need for open conversations with the communities on responses like stop and search. You mentioned the, the difference in your experience, you know, from 30, 40 years on. Uh, but again, it's a tangible step to be able to take. Uh, Rosemary Mallet yesterday suggested uh, stop relate search uh, as uh, a means of trying to extend the, the engagement with community in a more constructive way during that. There were also conversations about the need for change within the internal dynamics of the police rather than just the engagement with the community. A lot of these themes 
come through to saying that, you know, there is a governance aspect, there is an education aspect, and there are tangible steps to be taken about structural and institutional change, again, measurable and not necessarily waiting for government. So uh, since you brought that up, I wanted to sort of get your view and then start bringing people together as we come to, you know, the close of what has been, I hope, a useful series for everyone. So let me start with Wilf for the closing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I'm, I'm, uh, at Heather's point about it's what we do is I think is very important. And certainly sort of, you know, in terms of um, uh, uh, policing, I live in Tottenham and I made that remark, you know, about what I see out on the streets. Uh, not just in relation to my own experience and comparing it to now, because I, but because I worked with young offenders in Tottenham for 10 years, um, and saw the way that uh, 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 policing worked. I mean, one of the things for me, I mean, I think for me, there's two things that are really important in this, in terms of what people do. One is demanding accountability. And I think, you know, in terms of stop and search uh, uh, and black communities, that is, that is that is a key question uh, that has never been answered. That's why you know, in terms of uh, the calls that there were, which you know keep getting rescinded for the police to have to explain why it is that they're stopping somebody and searching them. Um, the why uh, explaining how, in terms of the policing strategy, actually this is this is this is dealing with and protecting people in the community. Uh, has, has to be a really important feature of what people uh, uh, continue to debate because we know that in terms of stop and searches um, um, often uh, less than 5% of people are charged and less than 1% are actually convicted as a result of that. So it's not just about stop and search, it's the way those resources are deployed to police our communities and actually if there's no debate about that if, if in terms of governance the police aren't accountable to the community in any particular way in terms of how they uh, are police, uh, police them, there's never going to be trust. And if you throw racism into the middle of that mix, um, you know, it becomes absolutely impossible uh, and a toxic situation in, in our communities. And, you know, yes, you know, the Black Lives Matter was inspired by what happened to George Floyd. But, you know, I've been involved in many deaths in uh, custody cases in the UK. Uh, where there's a, the exact same experience in terms of lack of accountability for when people are killed in are killed in police custody in the UK. Um, so we we have to remember that. I mean, the final thing I, I, I want to say is that you know that you know we actually have to be demanding positive action. You know, it's not just a matter of equal opportunities. Um, um, equal opportunities are all very well, but they don't redress. Uh, the damage and the deficit that, that black communities have faced as a result of, of, uh, of, of, of institutional racism over centuries. And people often say to me when I talk about positive action, oh, well, you know, but you can't positively discriminate. Um, that's unfair. Well, as far as I'm concerned, uh, positive discrimination happens on an, you know, on a, on a, a huge basis in our society, right? It's positive discrimination in terms of white people over black people, right? And actually, if we're serious about having a racially equal society, uh, then we have to look not only at providing equal opportunities, but how we redress that balance. Uh, and it, in some ways, which speaks to what what uh, what Sondra is saying about well, actually, if boards are really saying, if the companies are really saying saying that actually they want to do something on this agenda. Uh, let's see them put black people in the boardrooms. But, you know, um, let's see them put them, you know, right up the structure. Let's, let's let people into, into areas of work that they're usually excluded from, you know, uh, and, and let people stop using this excuse, oh, we don't, we don't know any black people, um, uh, or we don't think that there's people out there that have got the skills and experience to do that. Uh, because in my, in my experience, there's people who have got skills and experience in all kinds of things um, in our communities. The problem is, is actually they never get the opportunity to use those um, 
because actually uh, they're stereotyped as as people who are, are, are not educated, haven't got skills and experience. And I say that very much as stereotyped. It, as part of the narrative, oh, black communities don't will do well at school. Well, actually, you know, what the data shows is they don't do well at school because of the, of, of, of the racism in the, in, in the school system. Often what then they do is leave and end up going to further and higher education. So by the time you look at the workforce, uh, they're, they're proportionately more qualified than the white population, but they still don't get into jobs. Um, and that's why I talk about we need to stop pretending in, in terms of all this that we're living in some kind of a meritocracy because we're not. Um, it's not about how hard you work at school, uh, you know, what qualifications you've got. Uh, uh, obviously, there are some factors, but they are not the determining factors over how the real life experience of most people from black communities. So no, we've heard a lot on the, the kind of experiences that WOLF has had, the structural aspects, the institutional aspects. You've, you've mentioned the, the need to change governance models and to be coordinated across communities for this. Uh, I'd like your views on what, what else we can do for sustained change you know, at a time like this. <laughs> Well, it's an opportunity to, to seize. I think there's more to be done with the frame of real meritocracy, fairness for everybody, because it is a way to break down ethnic inequality, class inequality together uh, and to push harder on that. In terms of seizing this moment, I think if we ask why have when we've made progress, what made it work? And where we haven't, what made it fall short? The thing that really has done well for race relations and the fall in overt prejudice in this country was much closer contact and connection between different ethnic groups in this country. And it's been a profound shift across the generations. The experiences of um, uh, the 18 year olds, the 25 year olds in terms of their levels of inter-ethnic contact of what they've grown up with, especially in the big cities, but also now in the suburbs, also now in towns, means that they feel they have a lot in common. And that's incredibly important, I think, as to, as to, as to, as to what we've got to make progress. Why that then hasn't turned into the institutional changes we've been talking about today is, except for big flashpoint moments, there were riots in 1981, there's the Stephen Lawrence moment for a few years, there's the George Floyd moment now, it's been easy for it to slip back to be marginalised. That will be more difficult now, I think, when you're talking about one in six of the population, when you're talking about such a large percentage of young people. So I think we've got to keep it on the agenda and say to people, what are your timetabled commitments for change this year that you will have brought about this year to go with the commitment to act? I want to be a bit challenging to people who say empathy, dialogue, listening because that's always valuable but I think a lot of people feel that that slightly therapeutic approach to diversity training is an alternative to changing your institution so that so make the change that is in your power and show what you can have done and tell us what you're going to do this year that's the test I think of anybody who's used a hashtag. Heather what about you the you know as we're coming to the close and before I just uh, you know come to the summing up uh, you've been studying this for a while, a lot of the structural changes that would take place through curricular change, through the training of teachers, through the education. These are longer term elements. There is also this sense of waiting for others to do it and acting ourselves. Uh, from, from your perspective, what are the things that can be done now and sustainably? Because uh, it's clear that you would have a, a good vision for the longer term, but what can we get going with as part of this momentum? <laughs> Um, yeah, kind of just pre just reiterating kind of what I've already said, just kind of making sure like the onus is, is, is on both teachers and educators and on the government to make these sustained changes and to kind of um, really um, 
but, you know, to work together in changing in changing the curriculum. And I think it's an ongoing kind of continual process that, you know, we need to keep reflecting yearly on how we can make the, the curriculum um, better and more kind of inclusive um, a, a, as possible, really. And this the kind of I, the knowledge that, you know, the refreshing and the renewal of the curriculum um, is good. It has to be a, a yearly kind of um, thing and that there is no finite end to this it just has to it has to be a continued process and we need to keep kind of listening and engaging in a dialogue with people from um uh, BAME uh, communities and listening you know to what they think about what needs to be done to change our curriculums and, and but to act on it importantly and to bring I think it was mentioned the other day in the previous kind of webinar um, and it's also mentioned in the Cumberland Lodge um, report on uh, difficult histories that we need to bring people um, from um, BME um, communities into the classroom to kind of speak um, about their the histories from their own perspective and we need to kind of make those connections with the wider community in order to have this kind of broad range of voices included um, and I just feel like this will really help kind of the next generation of kind of um, students not only to have kind of or the students to have a more balanced perspective but the next generation of educators to realize that you know this is an ongoing process and it's something that we need to continually reflect on um, and um, you know keep changing um, and that we it's yeah, it's just something that we need to just keep doing. Thank you. Well, we come to the conclusion of what has been uh, a hope for all of you listening and who would watch this later, uh, really focused series on being able to look into the context of race as we follow the Black Lives Matter miniseries for the last couple of weeks. Uh, we hope the ideas generated during this four-part webinar not only serve as a source of learning and inspiration, but also help to inform a short and interdisciplinary report on the topic of race and justice. The report that will come out will feed into the government's forthcoming racism inquiry, other initiatives sparked by the Black Lives Matter movement in order to create, we hope, this sustainable, meaningful and urgent change to the way in which ethnic minorities are treated in the UK. Heather, Wilf, Sundar, thank you all very much for your contributions and for being able to share your experience and knowledge with us. A, a reminder at this time that like all charities, Cumberland Lodge faces difficult times during the current pandemic. If you have been enjoying our dialogue and debate series and you'd like to support our work, we'd be grateful if you'd consider making a small donation. Right? This can be done online via Just Giving page, and the link to that will be put up shortly after the webinar. If you would like to continue to get alerts on forthcoming webinars in the dialogue and debate series, you can sign up on the Keep in Touch page of the website, or simply email us at inquiries at cumberlandlodge.ac.uk. You can find out more about the work that's done at Cumberland Lodge on our website, at cumberlandslaw.ac.uk. It only leaves me to say thank you again to all the guests, particularly to Sunda, Wilf, and Heather. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for watching.